Philip represented himself when he first appealed his extradition from the UK. He told judges that Keisha Thompson was his fiancée and was a key alibi to prove he wasn't at the boat ramp. If only she could be found. She was potentially in New Orleans. Quote, It is feared that she may have been a victim of the hurricane in 2005. I found Keisha. She declined to be interviewed, but she confirmed Philip was not with her the night of the murder. And she never offered him an alibi. She asked for her condolences to be passed on to Josh's family. Josh's family had been told years earlier that prosecutors weren't going to bother with Keisha as a witness. They said it would distract from the damning statements from Philip's other woman, Kim Holloway, the mother of two of Philip's children. But Josh's family said, quote, what on earth is going on? Is the state trying to lose our case? This is the story of how the murder of Joshua Hayes in Florida led to a killing in Scotland, and how one mother kept fighting despite the legal systems of two countries moving slower than even their lawyers expected. Chapter 8. Never Quitting My name is Tristan Stewart-Robertson, and I'm a reporter in Scotland who has been following this story for 15 years and poring over thousands of pages related to the case. Throughout so much of those 15 years and longer, Patricia was left wondering what was going on she was in an intense struggle with prosecutors to make sure the case would get to an indictment and then would get to a trial and then would get Philip in the same country. More than once, she and her family would chase leads and witnesses themselves. And Patricia would try to pull apart all of Philip's claims and excuses. I'm going to pull them apart too in this episode, and I'll reveal some of the previously unreported maneuvers going on while Patricia and I thought nothing was progressing with the extradition. Patricia was working overnight in Walmart in 1999 to help with the changeover when Josh was killed. To keep tabs on Philip in court, she stayed on nights working by night, seeking justice by day, became Patricia's life, not just for months, but for decades. We heard about the arguments over the 175-day speedy trial limit. But while those appeals were being lodged in court, Patricia and her family were keeping their own records. She documented in painful detail her frantic calls and emails and letters to prosecutors, the governor, anyone who would keep the case moving. And that's before Philip even fled the country, or at least before anyone knew he had already left. They even tailed the witnesses who were at the boat ramp. Remember, it was Josh Hayes, Philip Harkins, Terry Glover, Tony Randall, and Leon Madden. 
Once Philip was gone, we rely on the emails between Jacksonville prosecutors and U.S. Department of Justice officials and lawyers for Philip. Even as Patricia and her family were left wondering what was going on with the case, bureaucracies were talking to each other. Slowly. Initially, Patricia believed the gun was crucial to the case. She and husband Robert walked from the trailer park up and down both sides of the full length of Mayport Road. They checked the woods behind the Oak Harbor boat ramp. A couple years after the murder, Terry clarified in a deposition from which side of the Damas Point Bridge he and Philip supposedly threw the gun. Patricia, her sister, and Robert went out in a boat and walked around Quarantine Island under the bridge in case it hit land. Robert later got his diving buddies to help search the water under the bridge. From just four days after the murder, the state attorney's office was a battle for the family. They had expected the case to be more clear-cut. Assistant State Attorney Chris Karpinski told the family there was enough evidence for Philip and Terry to be arrested. Then, three days later, he said it was a weak case. Josh's family argued it was a conflict of interest for Karpinski to prosecute their son's murderer. They pointed out that over the preceding year, he prosecuted Josh on the lewd and libidinous charge. By November 1999, Chris Karpinski went into private practice, and a letter, still bearing his name, was sent saying they were declining to pursue charges. The next assistant state attorney called the family and told them in a, quote, very blunt, loud, and heartless tone that nobody would be assigned to the case until detectives got more information. As detectives worked on the case in December, Patricia and Robert wrote to Florida Governor Jeb Bush. They said the state attorney's office was not returning their calls, but detectives told them they were frustrated too. Then Angela Corey was assigned the case, and the family believed it was thanks to writing to the governor. The family wrote, She takes charge, works hard, rolls up her sleeves, puts in long hours, and puts the case together. She is amazing, gets more witnesses, more information. But pre-trials, final pre-trials, trial dates missed, phone calls ignored. The original race to an indictment became a tortoise crawl in the official court paperwork. The Duval County Court System allows forensic, line-by-line transparency of a case docket. But it offers only the briefest hints at why justice moves so slowly. The case saw almost no progress throughout 2000, 2001, and 2002, with Patricia increasingly frantic for action. Eighteen months after she took over the case, Angela Corey was off and Tom Kimbrell took over. We are very unhappy, wrote Patricia and Robert. They found out about the prosecutor change in August 2001, three months after it happened. The trial was kicked to January 28, 2002. At the pre-trial, Tom Kimbrell wasn't there, and the next day, there were problems with Tony and Leon. Nobody knew Philip had already left the country. By March 2002, Leon gave a deposition and claimed that the shooter was six inches taller than Philip, the gun was different, and the voice was different. Philip used that later in his UK appeals. Josh's family weren't happy, especially about Tom Kimbrell. Robert said others at the boat ramp were, quote, laughing at our system and at us. 
the family felt like the criminals. In April, another assistant state attorney was very negative about the case and said it was extremely weak. He also told them the speedy trial issue was probably a fatal one. Robert wrote that the prosecutor told them he would much rather have the defense's case. Then the state attorney's office couldn't find Tony. But Patricia's daughter, Elizabeth, saw him on a Sunday morning in April, and the family tried to call detectives and prosecutors. No answer. Robert described what happened when he arrived at Elizabeth's home. He wrote, I am behind him at the red light. He is making eye contact through his rearview mirror, shaking his hand, and it appears cursing. I had no idea he knew who I was. The light turns green and he heads off, fast, then slow, fast, then slow, all over his lane. I move to the middle lane, then back in behind him at Atlantic Boulevard. When I do this, he takes off, heading west. I follow. He speeds up, going in and out of traffic. I back off because of traffic and safety concerns. He speeds up, and I lose him. Later that month, Patricia had her last straw after several calls to prosecutors. Still unaware Philip was gone, Robert wrote, My wife and I have been to every hearing, every pretrial, over almost three years, and the shooter has only appeared for a few. I guess he is not required to be inconvenienced as much as the victims. Robert had his military orders extended so he could stay with the family and the case. Vacations were cancelled. They ran back and forth to court and tried to locate witnesses. They believed they were doing the justice system's job when its players wouldn't. The trial was passed to July 8, 2002. In the weeks leading up, the family pushed for action against Tony, later calling daily as the trial got closer. This is when prosecutor Tom Kimbrell told the family they wouldn't bother with Keisha, who showed Philip had no alibi. Patricia was totally devastated and depressed from three years of fighting, said her husband. He wrote, What on earth is going on? Is the state trying to lose our case? Is this guy incapable of dealing with a murder case right now? Is he competent to fight for us? We need Angela Corey. On Monday, July 8th, there was a move to delay because the defense was not ready. Judge Weatherby asked where Philip was. He said he hadn't seen him in some time. He was given until Friday. Patricia and Robert tried to see Angela Corey. On Friday, Philip was a no-show, and his ROR was revoked. Josh's family sent their timeline to the Justice Coalition, news channels, and others. Within days, there was a TV appeal to find Philip. There was a $5,000 reward in Florida for information. And a few weeks later, Philip put himself in the heart of a news organization. He got a job in the accounts department of Scottish Media Group. All Philip's arrest forms said he was born in Scotland. It just required them to look. Philip could have been in jail when the murder happened. He was arrested for driving while his license was suspended in May 1999. 
he was sentenced to serve consecutive weekends in jail. When he failed to turn up, a warrant was issued for his arrest on June 18th. He was finally arrested for that six weeks after the murder. Once he was formally indicted and released on his own recognizance, there were no conditions to break, and they didn't take his passport. Remember, on paper, Philip was listed as a U.S. citizen, regardless of his birthplace. But Philip did come to the attention of authorities again. There were three different traffic offenses over the next year, such as driving again while his license was suspended. On December 5, 2001, either one or five days before Philip fled the state, according to his own accounts, Philip allegedly submitted two worthless checks for obtaining property less than $150. The case and an order for his arrest weren't launched until August 2, 2002, a month after his ROR was revoked for the murder. There were earlier warrants out for Philip too, just not in Duval County. There is no information whether Jacksonville police or prosecutors were ever aware. In May 2001, Philip was charged with careless operation of a marine vessel in St. John's County. An order for his arrest was issued in July 2001, a year before Duval County noticed he was missing. Ultimately, that case was dismissed after Philip turned up in Scotland. In Hillsborough County, in May 2000, while he was appealing to the Florida Supreme Court, Philip was caught driving while his license was revoked as an habitual offender. He pleaded guilty, and it was a felony, but the judge withheld the adjudication, so basically they didn't record the conviction. Philip was ordered to do community supervision, but then he violated his probation in February 2002, two months after he left Florida, and four months before Duval County ordered their own warrant. So why did Philip leave Florida? In the UK, he said he didn't think he would get a fair trial. But he never went into more detail. I wrote to Philip, but he never replied. Again, open records laws allow us a picture of what was going on beyond Philip's driving and boating offenses before he left. Philip's landlord at Pioneer Point started eviction proceedings in July 1999. The landlord in Philip's subsequent home raised three court actions to evict him in January, July, and November 2001. The last court judgment against him was recorded the same week as Philip said he left. Then there's the mothers of Philip's children. They also took him to court. A paternity suit against him was launched in October 1998 in the state of Maryland. It was dismissed in June 1999. Kim Holloway, who pleaded for more support from Philip weeks after the murder, then launched a paternity suit over their two children. Philip was ordered to pay child support in November 2001. A month later, he left the state. Once Philip was gone, when did authorities know he was in Scotland? And what did they do to get him back? Patricia told me that the day after the TV appeal to find Philip in July 2002, there was a tip that he was in Scotland. A press release from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement claimed the tipster gave the exact address of Philip that day. Later prosecutor documents state they knew he was in Scotland around September 2002, nearly four months 
before he caused the fatal crash in Greenock. But they said they were unable to confirm this for several months. It is unclear what efforts were made. It wasn't until January 13th, just 13 days before Philip's dangerous driving, that a draft red notice application was made to the U.S. Department of Justice. Florida couldn't just tell police in Scotland they were looking for someone. It had to go through national-level channels. The red notice was never finished before the crash. If it had been, the international police organization Interpol would have alerted all police forces to Philip. The Department of Justice wrote back to Florida prosecutors because there were bits of information missing. But it stated that Philip was, quote, armed, dangerous, violent. But the U.S. did request Philip's arrest on January 17th, and a warrant was issued the next day, nine days before he killed Gene O'Neill. There was a related suggestion of a criminal investigation of Philip in December 2002, again weeks before the crash, over an alleged assault of his girlfriend. But Scottish police, based on Florida documents, didn't know Philip was wanted for murder in the U.S. Once Philip was discovered after the crash, the state attorney's office asked, quote, Am I correct in assuming that complete extradition work would act as a hold on Harkins when he is released from UK custody and that he would then be put on a plane to Florida in US custody? The initial weeks reflect US officials trying to work out how a Scottish prosecution was going to affect an extradition. Philip claimed he had no convictions in the US the Department of Justice asked if that was true and for all background. They needed to present everything within days. And then the emails start to sound like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? June 2003. What word, if any, from London? August 2003. Got a call from my judge wanting to know if there was any news. October 2006. I do not mean to be troublesome, but my judge is kind of on my case. Is there any update you can give me on the status of the extradition? March 2007. I suspect that this will be sufficient to convince the UK court that Harkins will not be subject to the death penalty and that Harkins will be extradited within the next two or three months. May 2007. Any word on a time frame on when we might be getting him? Seems like they'd be getting tired of feeding him. June 2007. Any word on our friend? April 2008. Just curious if there are any updates. Meanwhile, Josh's family again wrote to Governor Jeb Bush. But nothing changed. Philip always protested his innocence. His lawyers argued at the European court that the alleged crime was an accident. But they also maintained he wasn't there in the first place. But Philip also offered to plead guilty. September 2010, four months before a UK court appeal. More than a year 
before his first loss at the European Court of Human Rights. And almost seven years before he was extradited back to Florida. I can reveal that Philip's long-term UK lawyers wrote to the state attorney's office in Jacksonville. Again, this is available through Florida's open records laws. They wanted to discuss a possible plea bargain. They said the extradition was uncertain and the process could last many years. His lawyers said the case had weak evidence and they raised the speedy trial issue. We note that of the three material witnesses, Madden has never implicated Philip Harkins in the murder. Randall has recanted his evidence given to the prosecutor and detectives, alleging prosecutorial misconduct. The main witness, Glover, was a co-defendant who was gravely compromised as a witness of truth, having admitted lying under oath and to investigating detectives. We understand that Glover was given a non-custodial sentence for this offence. It is quite clear that Glover was a willing participant in the attempted robbery of Mr Hayes. He was for all intents and purposes a principal to the offence of felony murder and therefore guilty of the same. However, after admitting taking control of the aftermath of the shooting and having been at the time on probation for firearms and drugs offences, Glover received a non-custodial sentence. Since being placed on probation, Glover was found in violation for committing further offences and not complying with the conditions of his probation. Nevertheless, his probation was modified and continued. In fact, we note that as recently as November 2008, Glover was charged with several serious felonies which concerned burglary and violence. Nevertheless, his probation was continued and only a two-year custodial sentence imposed for the burglary and assault and battery offences. We note that since 1999, he has been convicted of seven felonies and two misdemeanours. In view of the matter in which the case has been disposed of against Glover, if our client was to receive a mandatory sentence of life without parole and his co-accused given a non-custodial sentence, the gulf between their sentences would be grossly disproportionate. In fact, it is nauseating to envisage that two accused who stand charged with attempted robbery, which resulted in the accidental death of the victim, would see one accused given a non-custodial sentence, while the other would spend the rest of his life in prison, from a very young age. Conclusion In light of the above, our client submits that his extradition and conviction are remote possibilities at best. However, he has now been in custody for eight years and wants to put matters behind him and continue with the rest of his life. In these circumstances, we are instructed to approach you with a view to entering into discussions with a view to a possible plea bargain and that to that end, we would propose that we discuss the matter in a conference call in the near future. There is no paperwork in what was released by prosecutors as to whether there ever was a call, or even if the letter was answered. Regardless, it didn't derail years of legal appeals. In the midst of those appeals, though, there was another position from Phillips' UK solicitors, and it forced Florida to ignore Phillips' other crimes. In July 2012, four days after he formally lost his first European court appeal, solicitors made further representations to the Home Office. Here we encounter something called the rule of speciality. It means someone can't be extradited for one crime, then charged and punished for another crime once he or she is returned. Solicitors listed three offenses committed by Philip after he was released on ROR and before he left Florida, as well as the crime of failing to appear as required by the ROR. His lawyers said the Jacksonville crime of driving while his license was revoked or suspended could lead to five years in prison. 
the Hillsborough County driving offense could also mean another five years in jail. But there was something else. Remember how Kim took Philip to court for child support? He was ordered to pay $10,420 in back payments from the time of their births, plus $95 and $10 weekly, along with interest and reasonable fees until both children were 18. Philip's UK lawyers said he didn't know about the paternity case. They checked with the Florida Department of Revenue, who said he would be subject to arrest and imprisonment for failing to pay. The arrears were calculated to be nearly $69,000 without interest or fees. Philip's lawyers said that could mean a maximum of five years for $10,000 and potentially multiple charges to make up the total. They said this was a civil matter, but he was subject to arrest and imprisonment. But they said Philip never had a chance to defend himself in the original child support claim. And they said paternity wasn't established by genetic testing. So Philip asked for assurances he would not be prosecuted for any of these past crimes or the child support arrears. It is submitted that this is not an unfair request, considering the defendant has been on remand in the United Kingdom in excess of nine years, and the United States government could have amended the extradition to request at any time over the past nine and a half years, if it so desired to secure the defendant's extradition on the offences listed in these representations. This letter to the Home Office then prompted communications to the U.S. Department of Justice and to Florida prosecutors. They asked for an urgent response to the claims. According to documents, Philip was set to be extradited within days. But it took nearly two months of back-and-forth emails and a bit of prodding every few days to finalize. Just before it was signed off, the Department of Justice wrote to prosecutors, quote, can you let me know where things stand with this response? I am afraid that if we delay much longer, you run the real risk of losing him altogether due to delay. Let me know if I can help, but we must get this out before the end of the week. They sorted this aspect, but of course, there were another five years before Philip returned to Florida. He will never be punished for the other driving offenses he will never pay the child support arrears. He will never be punished for fleeing the country. Mark Borello was an assistant state attorney and assigned to the case during some of its early years of limbo. Now a judge, he told me that he recalled concerns about the strength of the case. I don't recall ever really getting into the nuts and bolts of sitting down and, and um, as you would normally when you're preparing a case for, for trial and for prosecution, you would sit down and look at your witnesses, look at your physical evidence, look at what you got, strengths, weaknesses, etc. I don't recall ever making that analysis because we, it, it, it never, when I was involved in it, it never reset stage. We're just trying to get the guy back. Did the case require the gun? What was the weakness? I don't, I don't think you can, in any individual case, well, in any individual case, you would look at, you could say, okay, in this case, we need the firearm, or in this case, they need a, an eyewitness, what, whatever the case may be. Uh, I, I don't think you can say, in any case, um, looking at it generically, okay, you got to have this, you got to have that. I mean, you can have cases where you don't even have um, a body. And it can be prosecuted if you've got other evidence. So, again, I can't tell you there are others, Mr. Skinner, for example, who I guess ended up uh, prosecuting the case, could tell you what, what he had and what he didn't have. I do remember, I, don't, I, I can tell you, I remember having a conversation with Tom Kimbrell, who was the prosecutor that I took over from, 
and I don't remember the specifics of the conversation other than he expressed great concern about the strength of the case. So I remember that. And, uh, and again, from my perspective, when I was handling it, um, my concern was getting him here. And then we'll figure it out. We've already spoken about the bullet casing at the boat ramp matching a casing collected from a gun range on the day Philip took target practice. He was seen by multiple people before the murder with the type of gun used to kill Josh. His alibi was no alibi at all. But the gun wasn't found, and there wasn't any other forensic evidence from his clothing or cars that were at the scene. Philip focused on Terry as being the only witness saying he was at the scene. But remember, it was Tony who first put Philip at the boat ramp. But yes, everyone at the scene changed their stories, sometimes more than once in a given day. But they never offered alibis for where they were either. What about the gun? Every appeal by Philip said if he was there, that he hit Josh with the gun and it went off accidentally. Can that happen? I spoke to gun experts about the Mini-14 223 caliber semi-automatic rifle made by Sturm, Ruger, and Co. They told me it's usually used for recreation hunting or by ranchers and farmers. In the U.S., it's not part of legislative limits on other semi-automatic weapons. For comparison, it is in Canada, where the same make was used or was in the possession of Canada's two worst mass killers. The gun experts said the gun could have had a defect, but the make passes drop and shock tests. It was unlikely to go off. But it is more likely to discharge because someone is holding the gun with their finger in the trigger guard. They can pull the trigger in the act of using the gun to strike someone. The gun is built to keep your finger on the trigger, so it would go off easily. I was told it's why new guns have safeties that aren't manipulated by the index finger. For the gun to go off, It needed to be loaded and ready to kill. And the Mini-14 that killed Josh did just that. And it destroyed the side and back of his head. Patricia paid hundreds of dollars to get the state's entire file copied many years before Philip would ever return to Florida. She has spent as many years pushing through that sea of information to pick and pull at Philip's arguments and excuses. She saw the lies and applied moral judgments in the absence of those in American courts. Judge Borello said it remained a unique case. You are absolutely right. I've, I've never seen anything like it. It, uh, for a number of reasons, one of which we've already talked about, which was the uniqueness and the difficulties of getting someone extradited from uh, a close ally. Uh, you know, you could see it if it was, if we're trying to extradite somebody from a country that we don't necessarily have good relations with, but, um, but it, it, it struck me that uh, how difficult it was to do that. So that's, that's um, one factor that makes it, I think, a very unusual case. And then the other is um, just the, the, the time frame. It's not unusual to have a case that results in a prosecution and eventually a, a conviction for, say, a cold case, you know, a murder that occurs 20, 30 years ago. 
And you get DNA evidence down the road and the case gets prosecuted and go from there. But for here, for there to be an initial prosecution and then all these twists and turns where he's released and flees the country and is involved in another death and serves prison time for that and then the difficulties in getting him back. You know, I've, I've been involved in the criminal justice system for over 30 years in various capacities, and uh, I've never seen anything like it. And he gave Patricia the credit for getting the case so far. Uh, but she is to be commended for uh, how she stuck with it, because I, 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 I'm I, sure it's fair to say that had she not done that, that you and I would probably not be sitting here talking about it. Philip offered to plead guilty, but didn't. And then came seven years of almost nothing happening. But for Patricia, she suffered loss after loss after loss. In the space of months, she lost her brother in March 2013, then her mother in September, her sister-in-law the next April, and a sister that October. And then a year later, they lost Jordan, Joshua's granddaughter and little sister, to Lexi at just six months. Patricia said the losses were like boom, 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 boom. Today, Patricia assures Lexi that her papa Josh is looking after Jordan in heaven. She makes sure their memories are alive and with her. Raised Baptist Patricia watches church services on TV from Mississippi on Sundays. But it was hard to hold on against so much loss and seemingly fights that never ended. Patricia almost never misses work. Decades of night shifts, waiting for justice, Google searching for news when nobody would tell her, waiting for my calls with news maybe once a year. This is what her son Joseph told me. As, as a person, period, she's the, probably the strongest person I've ever met. I don't know how she's been able to carry on this long. I don't get it. You know, she's carried my grandfather passing, her mother passing. You know, we I think we buried six people within a nine-month period. And I, I don't get how she can be so strong and keep moving forward the way she does. I couldn't handle it. Joseph has loved to write since it became an outlet after his brother died. He has a collection of poems, including ones about Josh and their mom. Um, the poem's called Never Quitting. You changed my life, for that I'm thankful. You showed me some things in life are worth going for. Not giving up, never quitting, continuing on, the expense forgetting. To achieve my goals, not letting go to things I hold so dear. Over all obstacles, no matter how high, I will persevere and never die. Murder Without End is reported and edited by Tristan Stewart Robertson and produced by Liam Pollock. Music by Dylan Anthony. Artwork by Jason Skinner. Rebecca Day read the letters from Phillips UK solicitors. Sources for this episode are interviews, court records, police reports, and documents released under Access to Information. Journalism like this might be free to listen to, but it isn't free to make. A Murder Without End was created without any funding. 
All research, archive audio, voiceovers, and music were sourced and paid for by myself. So if you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with your friends, leave a review, and visit our website, tomorrow.is, to donate what you can. Any support you can spare would be invaluable. Thank you for listening.